Hello folks and welcome back to the geodynamics lectures on heat conduction and production. In this lecture number four of the lecture set, we're going to look at heat transfer in one dimension. The goal for the lecture is essentially to look at how we can calculate temperature in the earth in one dimension, including heat conduction and heat production. We could start by looking at a simple snapshot of some infinitely thin slab of the earth. Okay, so we're going to look at the heat flux then across a slab of some thickness delta y. Okay, so here's our slab in the picture. It has h for its heat production and at position y and then y plus delta y means it gives it a thickness of delta y and there's a heat flux q at y and a heat flux q at y plus delta y. The net heat flux then is going to be the heat flux out minus the heat flux in, so that would be qy plus d delta y minus qy. And if we use a Taylor series expansion um, and Fourier's first law, we can see that this q of y plus delta y minus q of y can be rewritten as delta y times dq dy, and dq dy we can then take from Fourier's law because previously we had our relationship between q and um, q being equal to minus k dt dy. So we can plug that in here. So we have delta y times d over dy. So that's our derivative with respect to y. And there's where we've plugged in in place of q minus k times dt dy. And if you take then the second derivative of temperature, what you're going to end up with is delta y times minus k and the second derivative of temperature with respect to y. And this all works if we have a constant thermal conductivity as indicated by the letter k. Now, if we assume that the only source of heat in here in our slab is radiogenic heat production, we can actually say that the difference in heat flux across either side of this slab is the heat that's produced within that thickness of the slab. In other words, rho h times delta y, that would be the heat production, is equal to the change in the heat flux throughout the slab. From that then, we can simply rearrange things a little bit and we come up with a relationship. We have delta y's on both sides, they'll cancel out. So we get k times the second derivative of temperature with respect to y is then plus rho times h is equal to zero. And rho in this case would be the rock density. And so now we have an equation that looks like this. And if we make some assumptions about our uh, initial conditions or the boundary conditions for this problem, we can make an assumption that t equals t zero and q equals q zero at y equals zero. So in other words, if this is depth and y equals zero is the surface, we'll assume that we know the temperature at the surface and that's equal to T zero. And we know the flux at the surface, the heat flux, the temperature flux at the surface is equal to Q zero. In that case, then if you solve this equation with those conditions, um, you would simply be integrating with respect to temperature and you'd have um, some constants of integration that you can solve for and you would end up with an equation that looks like this. And so this is our equation for heat conduction and heat production in one dimension. So with this, we can plot a geotherm, and a geotherm is simply the change in temperature with depth. Our equation itself looks like this, where T equals T naught plus Q naught over K times Y minus rho H over 2K times Y squared. So not too complicated. Here's that same equation. And now we're going to take a look at a sort of silly case uh, about heat conduction. A sort of reasonably good estimate of uh, surface heat flow would be something like 70 milliwatts per square meter. They could say that we observe that at the surface and let's make some assumptions then that the temperature at the surface is about zero degrees C on average and rock density, we'll use a mantle rock density here of 3300 kilograms per cubic meter. And this is a volumetric heat production, or sorry, heat production by mass. Um, and then a thermal conductivity here. 
And so if we use these numbers and plug them into the equation, we could ask the question, what's the predicted temperature at 100 kilometers depth? And so I'd like you to go ahead and pause the video and calculate this. You can use the equation here and the numbers you have. Um, just be careful, for instance, with the units uh, for the heat flux, for instance, the heat flow. But go ahead and calculate your temperature at 100 kilometers depth. And uh, you can unpause the video once you have that calculation. Okay, well, hopefully you've got yourself a number and it seems like something that is reasonable. The question, of course, is does that number actually seem to make sense? Is it something that could be a temperature in the Earth at 100 kilometers depth? I hope that is the case. But what happens if you go to 200 kilometers depth? What kind of temperature do you get now? So go ahead and pause the video again, do your second calculation, and uh, come on back when you've got yourself a number at 200 kilometers depth. All right, so the point of this exercise, and I've not uh, given the temperatures here because we'll see them in just a second, is to look at temperature variations within the Earth. Here we have a geotherm. In this case, it is basically a straight line. And we can see that at 100 kilometers depth, we get temperatures of around 1,700 degrees Celsius. And that's not outrageous. It's a bit high, but it's not outrageous. Um, it's certainly po you know, a possible temperature in the interior of the Earth at that depth. And then if we go to 200 kilometers depth, we've got temperatures of about 3,500 degrees Celsius. Now, obviously, there's a bit of a problem here, and that is that the mantle is not a conductive um, medium. It's, it is conducting heat, but the dominant heat transfer within the mantle is not through heat conduction. It's, it's through convection of the mantle. So clearly, the mantle is not strictly a conductive environment. We can take a look at a couple other examples now of geotherms that are more uh, typical for places like continental crust settings. So here we've got a 40 kilometer thick crust and in this case we've plotted different colored lines for different heat production values just to kind of give you an idea of how much heat production can matter. In this case we're actually using a different equation than what was shown previously. This is one that has a constant um, heat flow boundary condition so at the bottom of the model you specify basically a gradient instead of specifying the gradient at the surface. But anyway, what you can see here is that the crust was 40 kilometers thick, for instance, that uh, just by changing the heat production, you could change the temperature at the base of this um, crust quite significantly. So you're under 300 degrees C here if you have no heat production. And if you have a constant one microwatt per cubic meter, you can see the temperature is in excess of 550 degrees C. So that clearly shows you the contribution of heat production in, uh, in this kind of setting. Now, why might this matter? Well, um, the brittle ductile transition, which is kind of an important transition in the Earth, um, where rocks go from dominantly faulting and behaving in a brittle manner to starting to flow and behave viscously, that occurs at about 300 degrees C. And so, if you look at this, uh, example of these three different geotherms with their different heat production values, you can see that the temperature or the depth at which you'd hit about 300 degrees C varies from slightly over 40 kilometers depth to as little as 15 kilometers depth. And so that would have a pretty significant influence on how the crust might be deforming where, you know, in the first case with no heat production, we might expect the crust actually to be brittle all the way down to 40 kilometers depth. So faults could easily cut all the way through the entire crust, um, whereas in the upper case, we'd only expect maybe the top 15 kilometers to be um, brittle and then perhaps be ductile beneath that. All right, so that's it for the lecture on uh, heat conduction and production in one dimension. It's time to take your quiz and see what you've learned, and we'll come back and talk about variations in heat production.